I would like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, the 54th chapter, and we'll begin with one verse of scripture in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. Remember that this 54th chapter of Isaiah is a continuation of Isaiah 53. And the Lord brings us to these tremendous truths that we can claim as our own because of what Christ did for us as he became sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All that we have as believers is because of Jesus. All that we have we owe to him. All the blessings are in reality God's blessings upon his son who lives in us and we give him glory for that. We deserve nothing. He deserves everything. We have everything in him and in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I hope at your leisure you'll read devotionally through this 54th chapter of Isaiah and meditate upon it. But we come to the 17th verse, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to remember this expression. I want you to remember this expression, the heritage of the servants of the Lord. The heritage of the servants of the Lord. We call this Memorial Day just in front of us. As far as we know in our nation, Memorial Day started with people remembering the dead and what the dead had done that influenced their lives, the lives of those who were still living. And most people trace our Memorial Day to the time of the Civil War when graves are being decorated with fresh flowers, people remembering their loved ones for the sacrifices made. It took a long time for that Decoration Day, they called it, to become a National Memorial Day with the last Monday in May being set aside by the United States Congress to remember the fallen in our wars through the centuries. And so they declared about, oh, 45 years ago, a National Memorial Day to honor those who had given their lives for our freedom. This is our American heritage. This is what God has given to us in the freedom, the liberty that we have. God created us with individual soul liberty. He made us free. We, we seek to be politically free. And all the freedoms we enjoy grow out of the freedoms that are a gift from God to us. Our founding fathers recognized that as they penned the documents that talk of our freedom these rights given to us by our creator, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So in reality, we have a national heritage, but our heritage goes far beyond that to what we have in the Lord. And we want to deal with that. Our Christian heritage, our heritage that we have in the Lord. Notice here he talks about in just one verse, no weapon and no words can overcome us. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. So we have God's blessed assurance over weapons and over words. I heard very recently that the man who came up with the formula to create a nuclear weapon said early on in his discovery that the greatest power known to man was that particular weapon. He recanted that statement and said near his death, I've discovered that the greatest weapon is not nuclear force, but the greatest weapon, the most powerful weapon on earth, is the weapon of truth. And it is. 
And the church of the living God, the Bible says, is the pillar and ground of the truth. And so when I am done, God willing, when I have finished this message, I hope that all of us are encouraged to know that God has given to us the greatest weapon on earth. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And that no weapon formed against us and no word formed against us can defeat us. The most tragic thing in our warfare is that we are not personally engaged in it. May God help us. I shared with you not long ago a special letter that I, I copied from a pastor in Nazi Germany. And uh, the letter came to me and I thought this is one of the most powerful things that I have ever read. I lived in Germany during Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because we could not stop it. We could do nothing to stop it. A railroad track ran behind our small church and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized it was crying Jews like cattle in those cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming and when we heard the whistle blow, we began singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard their screams, we just sang more loudly. And soon we heard them no more. Although years have passed, I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. God, forgive me. Forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians and did nothing to stop it. You see, the great need of the hour is a call to action. We're not left helpless. We're not orphans. We're not alone. The almighty God is with us. There's no doubt about that. But are we with him? Advancing forward. Moving out like a mighty army. I imagine when people celebrate the lives well lived of men and women through the centuries who have lived and died for our freedom, they recall certain things. I want us today to recall our heritage. Our heritage. I'd like you to write these things down, would you please? First, our heritage must be identified. Our heritage must be identified. I want you to turn with me back in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. In Deuteronomy, chapter 32, God is giving a warning to his people to always remember what they have in him. Beginning with verse 1 in Deuteronomy, chapter 32, the Bible says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves, their spot is not the spot of his children, they are a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus requit the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath brought thee and bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee. Thy elders and they will tell thee when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, 
He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. God looks at his people, his work, and he reminds us that we should identify his work, his people, and identify him in every generation. As each generation comes upon the scene, we have a tremendous responsibility as Christians, and that is to identify our heritage. What have we been given? And Moses here in this last book of the Pentateuch is identifying and warning. Turn with me, please, to the book of Joshua. Joshua's led the people after the death of Moses. They've crossed the Jordan. But they're doing a certain thing to remember and to identify their heritage. If you look with me in chapter 4 of the book of Joshua, let's begin with verse 4 of chapter 4. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them. If the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial. Would you mark that? Unto the children of Israel. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up the 12 stones in the midst of Jordan. So there's 12 stones here, 12 stones on the bank on the other side. Verse 20, and those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. So there's a memorial, a memorial. Uh, that means making an attempt to remember something. You and I need to remember, God said when we are blessed, we're apt to forget. It is our responsibility to remember our heritage. Let's make it personal. Nothing is real until it's personal. Nothing. We may speak of things as reality, but they're not real to us until they're personal. Do you, do you think of the heritage you personally have in the Lord and what's been given to us by the Lord through the faithfulness of his people through the centuries? We have this memorial, this remembrance, this recalling of the blessings of God. We can go a little further with that and think about our own lives or the life and ministry of our church. One of the great things that encourages me is to think of all the things God has come through with through all these years in this particular ministry. And I remember them. I must not forget them. I think of answers to prayer in my own life. There must be a deliberate identifying of our heritage. And we ought to take the time as the 78th Psalm instructs us, to sit down with our children and our children's children and remind them of the great works of God in our lives personally. What the Lord has accomplished. We need to tell people what we have here is a result of God's goodness to us and God's blessing upon us. What we have as a nation is a tribute and a testimony to the goodness of God. Now think of that. Let me show you something else. If you'll turn me to the Psalms just for a moment. In Psalm 127, there's a foundation God reminds us of. I'm talking about identifying our heritage. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain, they build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, 
For so he giveth his beloved sleep. In other words, while the worrying and fretting, hasn't God always provided and cared for us? This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes, 118th Psalm says. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Think of the heritage of the Lord. Do you identify the Lord's heritage in our lives and the life of our nation? We have a heritage of truth. As I said to you moments ago, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The most powerful weapon we have is the truth. And we must get out with the truth. We must propagate the truth. There's power in declaring the truth and giving the word of God. We are, we're discounting the Lord in our lives, in the life of our nation. We hear all the time, maybe 99% maybe of the time, we hear about everything that's wrong. God's people have to stop that. They truly do. God's people have to stop that. We need to talk about what God has done, who God is, what he is faithful in doing, and what he will continue to do if we obey him. Let us identify our heritage in the Lord. God gave that to his ancient people Israel, and I believe with all of my heart he's given it to us. And so we didn't just start today. Our history is the history of God's blessing. You and I don't live just from today, though we live the Christian life on a daily basis and we need daily faith for daily living and we have the promise of God that as we have a day, God will give us the strength for that day. But look at the Lord and all he has done to prove himself through our lives and through the centuries in our nation. Our founders recognize this. Historically, our nation recognizes this when we look at the real history of our nation. And you and I as God's children and as a part of this church need to identify our God-given heritage. No weapon formed against us, no word spoken to us can overpower our God. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Second thing I'd like for you to write down, please, and that is in our heritage, we must go back so that we might go forward. The reason we cannot have the progress we ought to have is because we haven't gone back to our memorials, to our heritage. It's impossible to move forward without going back. History tells us this. In the great moving of God, in great movements through the centuries. Well, let's talk about it from what we know to be true in Scripture. Let me give you a Bible example, if you'll turn with me, please, to the New Testament. Just the way it's worded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll talk about the memorial supper that the Lord gave us. And remember, this took place 2,000 years ago. But on a regular basis, the Lord wants us to go back to our heritage, back to this memorial in order that we might move forward. There is no going forward without going back. This is what's wrong, dreadfully wrong in our nation. We need a revolution back to our Constitution. We need a revolution back to our founders. We need to remember why this nation was formed and the motives people had for coming here and organizing and establishing a free country, not for their generation only, but for every generation to come. And so we must go back to go forward. You, you apply this often in correcting your children as a parent. Uh, we do this all the time, the Lord's work. We have to go back and say, this is our purpose. This is our statement of purpose. Or you, you say to your children in correcting your children, now look, this is what we've been taught. This is what we're all about. This is why we're here. And you're always going back so you can move forward. It's a principle. And don't be ashamed of it. And so much of this contemporary work today has, has cut off our heritage. That's a great crime against God and against God's people. Uh, people, I don't want any old hymns or any old sermons or anything like that. It's all new. It has to all be new. Well, listen. If it's true, it's not new if it's new, it's not true. 
And we need to go back to our heritage and identify our heritage. That doesn't mean that we don't use every tool God gives us at this present hour to propagate the gospel and proclaim the truth. But it means that we're not ashamed, we're grateful for our heritage as the servants of the Lord. I want you to listen carefully to how the Lord gave this instruction recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's begin with verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. I want you to mark that expression, in remembrance of me. In other words, as we often observe this memorial supper, we think of his broken body and his shed blood. God takes us back. Just as Moses said in the book of Deuteronomy, remember what the Lord has done for you. Just as Joshua said, with 12 stones taken from the crossing of the Jordan, remember what God did for us. Why? It must be identified so we can refer to it. And referring to it, going back to it, and thanking God for it, helps us to move forward the way God would have us to move forward. So we come to the Lord's table. We go back 2,000 years in our thinking to think that Christ bled and died for our sins. And then we go back in our thinking to our experience with God in salvation. And we serve Him because of what He's done for us. We cannot be cut off from our, our heritage. These are memorials that must never be forgotten. That's what this in memory of me is all about. A memorial, uh, simply stated, is an attempt to remember that thing, whatever that thing is, and you make a memorial of it. And so we call the Lord's Supper at times the memorial supper or the memory supper or the thing we remember that Jesus Christ bled and died. Think about this. Think how far we would drift away from what God's intent is if we forget God's intent. The Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Did you know that everything that surrounds us that is structured and, and uh, propagates truth and forward movement is based on this kind of principle? When you, when you go to court and you look at laws, you look at cases that have been settled and judgments that have been made, all of this grows out of the principles of the Word of God. And these decisions become precedents. They, they become markers or reminders to remind us and give our memory the prodding it needs. This is the way it's to be done. And when God's work starts moving away from God, when God's children start moving away from God, or when the nation established for the Lord's glory starts moving away from the Lord, we need a memorial, a remembrance, because we're going to be so off course, there'll be no forward progress. You see, we have people today, like we have in every generation, trying to reinvent America. America doesn't need to be reinvented. She's returned to her founding principles. You say, that sounds old-fashioned. No, it's just truthful. Truthful. Just like there are people trying to invent, reinvent the church today. The church is his body in this world. And when they start attempting those things, they move away from the person of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he came to do. As he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, and so we find all types of purposes for his body which were never his original intent. And we must return to the truth. We cannot go forward without going back to our beginnings, to our justification for existence. 
Baptists aren't necessarily the greatest fans of the Reformation, but we should have gained a lot of information from the Reformation. I agree with Mr. Spurgeon that Baptists existed before the Reformation. Uh, we were reformers before the Reformation. We did not come out of the Catholic Church because we were never in it. And I think I can prove that to you historically. But so much good was accomplished by the Reformation. But what did they do? It was about going back to the Bible so they could go forward. It's always good for us to go back to the principles, the foundations of truth and then move forward from that. Years ago on my first trip to Israel, late one night, an Israeli officer said, would you like to go beneath the diggings and the excavation of the temple walls? I said, yes. He said, well, we'll have to get a rabbi to take us. And we cannot speak one word. Can't make one sound. We're going through a, a long tunnel deep into the earth to the very bedrock of the temple walls. Now, this Orthodox Jewish rabbi led the way. An army officer was with us, a Jewish army officer. When they came to the name of God, the Orthodox Jew would not pronounce it. He would turn to the officer of the army who was not an Orthodox Jew and he would point to him as if to say, you have to read that. I cannot pronounce that name. That's the way Orthodox Jews are when they come to the name of God. They will not pronounce the name of God. They won't speak it on their lips. And the idea is, I may have hypocrisy in my heart and I don't want it on my lips because if what is on my lips is not true with my heart, that's hypocrisy. They honor the name of God as the scribes copying the word of God would bathe and wash and change pens when they came to the name of God, and change writing instruments because of their reverence for the name of God. But I remember walking through that area, dark, narrow, with the flashlights and those flashlights showing us the way as we walked till we finally came to a stop. And the officer said, gather closely in a whispered voice. He says, we're at the bedrock. It doesn't go any deeper than this. These are the stones that were laid in Solomon's temple on the bedrock. And they were huge, huge, long stones. He said, this is as deep as the wall goes. This is bedrock. We understood from what he said that we got to what holds the whole thing up, the foundation. What I'm saying to you, memorials bring us back to what holds all of it up, to the foundation. It reminds us why we're really here, what it's all about. You know, every one of us must have his own personal experience with God. I, I haven't been here for a quarter of a century. I've had my own personal experience with God. And many of you have been involved in that. You've been instruments the Lord has used in one way or another. You must have your own personal experience with God. Something may be going on right now and you think, I can't understand this. I, I just don't know why. I can't put my finger on this. And you may even have gone so far as to say, I'm going to blame somebody else for this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You may not know what's going on in your life, but did you know that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever? This is what God is doing with us. He's bringing us back so we're on solid ground again and we can move forward. He does that personally, individually. He does that in a family. He does that in a church. And I think he's doing that in a nation. That's why I'm hopeful. I'm truly hopeful. Not only must we identify, our heritage must be identified, but our heritage brings us back 
so that we're able to go forward. Let me give you a third thing. And that is that our heritage motivates us to stay true. Our heritage motivates us to stay true. I'm talking about the godly heritage. I would go so far as to say even the truthful heritage of our nation. I brought something with me, and I just want to read it to you. I could not quote it to you any better than this. This was written more than 20 years ago by a pastor in Arkansas. And the title is, It's Midnight Again, and he, he rehearses the ride of Paul Revere, the midnight ride of Paul Revere in our nation's history. Let me take a moment just to read it to you. Just relax and listen. The hour was desperate with British ships anchored in the harbor under the protection of cloak of night. The city of Boston slept, unaware, unsuspecting, defenseless. A young nation's destiny hung in the balance. As the city lay in a state of siege, Boston was overflowing with British troops ready to attack. A nation conceived in freedom seemed aborted before she could even be born. Deep into the chilly night of April 18, 1775, 700 British soldiers marched secretly through the streets of Boston, advancing to the riverfront. There they were to board small boats and row across the Charles River to launch a surprise attack on Lexington and Concord. The future of America looked as dark as the midnight sky overhead. But while all Boston slept, one man kept watching, remaining alert in the still of the night, wide-eyed to the approaching dangers at hand. Paul Refere refused to sleep. Across town, Dr. Joseph Warren was directing the Patriot activities in Boston. He knew a messenger must be sent at once to warn Lexington, a man of great courage, more committed to the cause than to his own life. So he sent for Paul Revere, a 40-year-old silversmith. The plan was simple. It called for Revere to row ahead of the British troops and ride through the night to Lexington and Concord to warn the sleeping citizens of the approaching danger. The call had to go out. Without hesitating and with the fate of the young nation resting on his shoulders, Revere dashed off to the old North Church, daringly with British soldiers asleep upstairs in the church, he awakened the sexton or the custodian. Two lanterns, two lanterns in the belfry, he whispered in a hushed, breathless tone, and do it now. The signal would be recognized by patriots across the river in Charleston, two if by sea. That meant the British would be coming that very night by boat, rushing home to tell his family goodbye, perhaps for the last time. Revere hurried to the waterfront. There, two friends promised to help him to the other side. They were going to row him to the other side. With muffled oars, they slithered past an English man of war, the Somerset, patrolling the river. Passing under the noise and the noses of 64 British cannons, Revere slipped by just slightly ahead of the British troops. They landed in the shadows on the other side safely. Men from Charleston had seen the signal and had a fast horse saddled and waiting for Paul Revere. And he rode off. Coattails flapping in the wind, hair flowing in the dark night, perspiration beating on his brow. Paul Revere stopped at every farmhouse village along the way with horse hoofs skidding to a halt, Revere rushed up to each house and pounded on the door, calling, The British are coming. Wake up. The enemy is upon you. All along the way, Minutemen rallied and answered the call. True to their name, they came running the minute they heard the call. Muskets were fired into the sky. Church bells began ringing. The call was relayed far and wide by each man. All went well, that is, until two English officers spotted Revere. One tried to ride ahead of Paul. The other attempted to overtake him from behind, but to no avail. Revere cut quickly through a field, galloped past a muddy pond, and found another road to Lexington. 
And if riding a horse of destiny, as he wrote it, nothing could stop him now. The call had gone out, approaching hoofbeats on the cobbled streets of Lexington, signaled his arrival. Urgently, Revere began beating on doors with a loud voice that pierced the cool night air. He shouted, to arms, to arms, the British are coming, the British are coming. Immediately candles were lit, windows flew open, curtains were flung back, heads peered out, and men dressed quickly. Each minute man grabbed his musket and awakened his neighbor. Shots were fired into the night air, torches were lit. There's no time to sleep. By early morning, area farmers were gathered on Lexington Green. Fifty to sixty minute men were rallied, armed, and positioned to stand against the approaching British. They were ready to die for the cause of freedom and to defend their families. As Redcoats marched onto Lexington Green, the first shots of the Revolutionary War were fired. The war had now begun. In the skirmishes of the, sky of the day, the colonists lost 93 at Lexington and Concord, but far worse, the English lost the lives of 273 soldiers. The die had been cast, a statement had been made, this was America's war to win. And it all started on the heels of Paul Revere's famous ride for freedom. The midnight ride of Paul Revere was a daring dash through the countryside of America to wake up a young, sleeping nation. It was a call to action, a call to bear arms, a call to stand and to fight. That the future of America hung precariously in the balance of the destiny of this nation lay in jeopardy. One man sounded the alarm and charged, changed the outcome of the war. On that dark night, with hope all but extinguished, the call was sounded. The course of the nation dramatically altered. It's midnight again, beloved. Midnight again. It's not just about our nation. Now listen carefully with your heart. At the heart of our nation is the truthful church that God desires to bless. It's our heritage. We cannot continue business as usual. We cannot. Time is running out. The enemy is at our door. Our memorial reminds us that we're to give our best. Our best. And do it now. When Peter wrote as an old man what we find in his epistle in the fifth chapter of the first epistle. The elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. This is something you cannot be forced to do. He says in verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage. You see, it's not my heritage. It's not your heritage. It's the Lord's heritage. And we've entered into it. And I don't want it to be said at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want it to be said that we lost what we had in these dark hours. No. No. But by God's grace, we rose to the occasion. And we did the thing God gave us to do. Are you up for it? Even if you're not, God will enable you. He'll make you up for it. We have very little time to decide. Identify your heritage. Realize we're going back to our beginnings to understand what it's all about so we can go forward. And when we recognize what we have, it purifies our motives and brings the best out for God and His glory. That's what this is all about.